Um, this session is called Google Forms for Everything. And so in case you didn't hear it, there is that link, uh, that tiny URL link that will take you to a website where I've got a couple sample forms. But more than that, let me let you know that that site also has all the resources from this presentation. So yes, there's the sample forms, but it also has a link to the presentation. And it's also got a link to a handout on how to use Google Forms. I mean, we've only got 45 minutes together, so there's no way I'm going to get into every little detail about Google Forms. So please know that handout there, it does that for you. You can, that handout's like a, I don't know, 12, 13 page handout that goes into all the gory details about exactly what you can do in Forms and this type of question and that type of question. So um, hopefully what I'll be showing you today is the basics of Google Forms, but then showing you the ideas of how to use them. More than anything, I want to show you what we're doing with Google Forms um, in our district, okay? So uh, that has a lot of good stuff on that site. Wow, somebody's got a lot of kids. Six kids. Wow. All right. All right. Oh, also, on that site, there's also a comment section. If you've got a question that I don't have time to get to today, feel free to throw it in the comments section there. I'll check that later and I'll try to post some responses. So if we just run out of time and I don't address something you, you would like to be addressed, please use that comments section on that same page. All right. Yeah. The results? Well, every time you refresh it, yes. Okay. Yes. Anytime you refresh that page, it will update those results further down on the page. They don't do it live while you're watching. We just have to refresh the page. Yeah. Um, you know, there's probably data in there that is from previous sessions as well. Yes. <laughs> I haven't cleared it out, so there's going to be some old data in there mixing with the new data. All right. All right, guys, let's go ahead and get started. All right, guys, um, let's start off by making sure you know what Google Forms is because maybe you've heard about it but never really messed with it too much. Google Forms is part of... Google Docs. Usually you think of Google Documents, Google Presentations, Google Spreadsheets. Google Forms is one of the pieces of Google Docs. So it comes with Google Apps for Education. It's totally free. You've got Google Apps, you've got Google Docs, and you've got Google Forms. Um, what can you do with it? Well, basically you create forms, surveys, quizzes, anything where you're asking questions that people can then fill in. Once you create those forms, you can share those with other people online. They complete them completely online. Nobody's filling out paper and pencil. They just do it all online. And then when they submit those, all that data comes back to you and it gets collected into a Google spreadsheet. So for every Google form, there is a spreadsheet view of that form, sort of on the back end of it. And all the data comes into the spreadsheet. Every row is a different person's submission. Once you get the data, you can do anything you want with it. You can make charts and graphs, you can sort it, you can do calculations on it, you can export it and put it into another system, you can, you know, uh, grade it like a quiz, all sorts of things. So once you get the data, there's lots of different things you can do with it. All right? So that's what Google Forms is. Now, there is a little difference between the Google Apps for Education version and the personal version. So, like, if you just have a Gmail account, if you just have a regular old Gmail address, and you go to Google Docs, you can make a Google Form. Looks the same as what I would do with Google Apps for Education with two differences. If you're using Google Apps for Ed, you can require that you have to be logged into the domain to fill out the form. So that is an extra step that you can throw in there. So when I create a form, I can say, you must be logged into the North Canton City Schools Google Apps for Ed domain, or else you can't fill out this form. That way, only the students or only the teachers or only people in my district fill it out if I want to. I don't have to. I can still let it be for anybody, but that's an option I get. I also have the option to collect the respondent's usernames. I can say this is anonymous or it's not anonymous. If I say it's not anonymous, when a student fills it out, it grabs their student ID. It grabs their username. Or a teacher fills it out, it grabs their username. I can't do that with a personal Gmail account because I'm not inside of a domain, 
but if you're using Google Apps or Edge, you do get those two extra little bonuses, which can be nice. That can be very helpful. Now, a lot of times we do anonymous surveys because I want to get good feedback. So I don't want them to think, oh, he's going to know who I am. So we do a lot of stuff anonymous. But especially if you're doing like a quiz with the kids and you're having them fill out a form for a quiz, you want to be able to collect who they are so that you can track that. Okay? So that's a little bit of a difference there. Question way in the back. Good question. Absolutely. If it is anonymous, it really doesn't say anything. It's, it's the other direction. When it's not an anonymous form, it says, please note, this username is going to be submitted along with this. If you are not this person, please log out and back in. And so you'll, I can actually show you that, but it gives you a little blurb at the top telling you if it's collecting your information. If it's anonymous, it doesn't say anything at the top. Okay. All right. All right. So today, let's talk briefly about how to create a form. Again, please don't walk out of here thinking that you need to know every button. There's just not enough time for that. But I want to show you the gist of creating a form. So you say, oh, OK, I see. That makes sense. I see what he's doing. And then I just want to spend a bunch of time showing you all these crazy ways we're using forms and what they've done for our district. All right. So let's go ahead and create a form real quick. I'm, I'm going to pop back over to my Google Docs screen. Oh, and by the way, like I said, the handout is here all about using Google Forms. So that thing, that'll tell you everything you need to know if you want to later on really get into the nitty gritties about everything about creating a form and all the different types of questions you can use and all the different options you have in there. So this, this handout goes into a lot more detail on that. All right. Well, here I am in my Google Docs screen, which is now called Google Drive, if you've upgraded to Google Drive. If not, it still is your Google Docs screen. Um, but uh, my screen will say Google Drive. Um, all I need to do in my Google Docs screen here is go up and click on the Create button in the top left-hand corner. Big red Create button. That's where I can make a document, or I can make a presentation or a spreadsheet, or I can make a form. That's just one of the options. I can create a form. So let me click on that and say, I'm going to create a Google form. This is the edit mode of a Google form. There's multiple ways to look at a form. There's the edit version of it. There's the live version that people take. And there's the spreadsheet version behind it that collects the data. This is the edit mode. So this is what it looks like when you're making the form. All right, there it is. So how does it work? Well, first of all, I'm going to go ahead and title this. So I'll just put in something like, I'll say, Ohio goes Google sample form. OK, very simple. Now here, I could put in a description if I want to, explain a little bit more about what this form is. I usually do, I usually do that when we're sending this out to students or staff or whatever. I say, hey, please take a moment to fill out this form. This is why we're doing it. This is what it's about. Thank you so much. So you can throw that in your description. Now, below there is where I can start creating my questions. By default, Google Forms makes two questions for you automatically. I don't know why they do it, but they go ahead and make two of them to start with. Sample question one and sample question two. Now, I can change them. I can delete them. I can do whatever I want. But they go ahead and they make two of them for you just to start with. So here's sample question one. I could say something like, what is your name? And there's a spot there for help text if I wanted to give more explanation, like please put last name first, then first name, or whatever, if I wanted to give some extra directions. Now, below there, you see a drop box where I can choose the question type. And there are seven different types of questions you can use in Google Forms. The first one is the text question. And that would make sense for your name because it's just it's a, it's a text box. Type in your name. Okay. But there are others. There's one called paragraph text. If I choose that, you see right away I get a much bigger box. So I could type in an essay or something much longer there. So that's great for something bigger. Or multiple choice. With multiple choice, I can put in as many options as I want, but they can only pick one. So multiple choice is only one answer can be selected, even though multiple answers are listed. That's different than the fourth option, which is checkboxes. Checkboxes have as many as you want, and you can check as many as you want. So it could be like, check off all of your favorite pizza toppings. And so you could choose more than one in there. Now, please notice both checkboxes and multiple choice 
have an option that says add other. So if you want, you can give people an other option and they can type in their own as well if you want that. Uh, the next one down is called choose from a list. Choose from a list is really the same thing as multiple choice, except the list folds up instead of showing the whole list. What do I mean by that? Well, let's say you're doing multiple choice and you say, what's your gender, male or female? That's pretty easy, it's just two buttons. But what if you're saying, put in your birth date and choose the day of the month? Well, that's possibly 31 choices. Do you really want all 31 numbers listed on the form? Well, no, just use the choose from a list and when they click the drop down, they'll see all 31, they pick their date, it folds back up. So you can make much shorter forms so they're not all long and lengthy. That's what choose from a list does. After that, you got the option for scale, like on a one to five scale or this to that scale, rank how you like this session or whatever the case might be. And then there's one called grid, which is pretty much the same as scale, except you can have multiple questions using the same scale. So you can say the next 10 questions all deal with this topic from you know one to five you know rank how you feel about each of these things and then you could have something for each of those 10 questions with the same scale for each so it's like a, uh, a a grid that goes up and down as well as side to side well i'm going to leave this one text what's your name it should just be a text box so that makes sense i can make it required or not if i check the make required button they can't submit it unless they fill something in so i can check that i'll hit done and that question is completed. At any point, I can hover my mouse above that, and you'll see I've got a pencil icon a, uh, for editing, a duplicate icon to make a copy, and a trash can icon to delete that question. So I can, at any time, I can hit the pencil, go back in to edit it some more if I need to. Let's go to the second question, sample question two. Let's go to edit that. Maybe for that one, I will say something like, you know, gender, maybe this is for, you know, students, I'm, you know, first day of school and I want to know information about them, so give me your name, give me your gender, give me this, give me that. So that one I would do like multiple choice and I would just say male and female, oops, there we go, male, female, hit done. Now, I've done the first two questions, the two they gave me. I need more questions. I want to ask them something else. What do I do now? Well, all I need to do is go up to the top left and click on the add item link up there. And that little button will pop up and I can add any of the type of questions I need. Maybe I want to throw in a paragraph text question. What do you hope to learn today? Whoops. Maybe how to spell, Eric. That might be a good thing to learn. Try that instead. Very good. Okay. So I can make that question. So I can go up and click add item to make as many questions as I want and then I can move them around even. I could say, oh, I wanted to ask that earlier. Click it, drag it, move it up. Oops, try that again, Eric. There we go. Now it's the second question. Ah, uh, nah, I think I do want it to be the third question. Okay, click it, drag it down. Now it's the third question. I can delete them, edit them, move them around, copy them, whatever. I can also add section headers and page breaks. We really won't get too much into that in our example, but I'll show you a few that use those. If you have a really, really long form, you might want to throw section headers in that say, the next few questions deal with this or whatever, just to kind of break it up a bit. And then page breaks can be nice if you want a form that only has a few questions at a time. And then they hit continue and they get a few more questions. And they hit continue and they get a few more questions. That can be nice if you don't want to overwhelm somebody with a whole bunch of questions all at once. Another nice thing about page breaks is, I know I didn't mention this, but if I go back to this multiple choice, take a look at this. There's an option here that says go to page based on answer. If you make page breaks and you make a bunch of different pages in your form, you could have people make a choice in a checkbox or, or no, I think it's just the multiple choice. In the multiple choice one, they can make a choice in multiple choice and based on their choice there, it will shoot them off to a different page in the form. So you could have one form that handles the sixth graders and the seventh graders and the eighth graders. You choose your grade, boom, boom, boom. It sends you off to the part of the form you need to see. We use that for a lot of different things as well. All right. Um, other than that, that's the basics of making the form. Now, what about the tweaking I can do, the different settings? Up at the top, you'll see three buttons here that I can check or uncheck. One says, allow users to edit their responses. If you choose that option, when they fill out the form, they'll get a link that displays on the screen 
And if they're logged in, they'll get an email that says, if you ever need to make a change to this form, click here. They can go back in and make changes. So that's an option. Then notice here it says, require North Canton City Schools sign in to view this form. If I uncheck that, anybody who has the link can fill it out, no matter who you are. If I check it, you have to be logged into my school's domain to fill it out. And then below there, automatically collect their username. Go back to that question we had earlier. Watch what happens. If I click that, this pops up. Your username will be recorded when you submit this form. Are you not this person? Then sign out. So it'll actually show them their username when they take it and let them know, hey, just be aware, we're going to collect who you are if you fill this out. So they're very upfront about what's anonymous and what's not. Other than that, um, I could change the theme. There's all kinds of cute themes. There's about 100 different color schemes and stuff. So you can pick fun themes so your forms look all cool. That's fine. Um, and that's the basics. There's a few other things I can edit. I can edit like the confirmation they get and stuff like that. But that, that's the basics of making a form. So what do you do? After you've made a form, what do you do with it now? OK. So I've got this form saved. I now need to get it out to people. I need to somehow share this form out to them. The only way you really share a form is basically as a link. You're giving people a link to this form. They follow that link, and then they get to the form. There's a couple of ways to do that. In here is a button that says email this form. If you click that, it will go ahead and it will send that link out to that form to whoever you put in that box. So I could send it out to all of my teachers or all of the eighth grade students or whatever. So if I know who it is, if I can actually type in their email address, boom, I could send that form out to them. Well, what if you don't know exactly who you're sending it to? Maybe it's the parents and you don't have all their email addresses. You just need them to be able to get to it. In that case, what you need to do is you need to copy the link for the form and somehow make that available to folks. Well, how do you get that link? At the bottom of the edit screen, you may not be able to see it real easy back there, but it says you can view the published form here. And there's a link that if I click, it will take me out to the live form. Remember, three views of a form, editing it, live version, and the spreadsheet that collects the data. This is the live version of it. This is what people see. So all I have to do is grab that link at the top. It's long. It's crazy. It's one of those really, really long links with all kinds of crazy letters in it. And that's what I need to share with people. Now, you can share it a lot of ways. You could send it as an email, or you could post it on your website, or you could make a QR code out of it, kind of like you see all around here. People could use their smartphones, go right to the form. Or you could use a URL shortener like tinyurl or bit.ly to make a nice short URL that lets people get to that form. So you just got to kind of think what's the best way to share that out with people. But basically, you need to get that link to them in some way that they can then get to the form. So what happens when somebody fills out the form? Well, they come in here and they type in their name and they put in their gender. And what do they want to learn today? How to spell, because I'm having trouble with that. And then they hit submit. That's what they do. Well, what's that do then? That brings us to the third view that we're going to talk about. We've seen how to edit a form. We've seen how people see the form, what it looks like to them. Now let's see what I see. Question, though. Before you go on, yeah. how can you change that URL so it's not as long? Well, you can't change the URL, but you can make like a, a use like a URL shortener, like bit.ly or tiny URL. So if I come in here and I grab this crazy long address here, I'll actually open it back up. Here it is. Grab this crazy long address. I could go to a service like tinyurl.com, and I could paste that crazy long address in there, and then I could come in and say what I want it to be. tinyurl.com slash kurtzform. 2012 or whatever. I can make up something that's easier to remember. Okay, that's a great way to do it. That works real well. Okay, 
Or again, you can make a QR code out of it if you haven't done that kind of stuff before. Just Google QR code. There's so many sites out there that generate QR codes. I use this one a lot, but you can use any one you want. Paste in that crazy long link, hit generate, and boom, there's your QR code. Anybody who scans that, it's going to take them right to that form. They'll get them right there. Yeah. So you've got to find a way to get that link out to folks. All right, very good. So we edited a form. We saw it live. Now, what's it look like when the data comes in? Well, if I go back to my Google Docs, you will now see that I have listed here Ohio Goes Google Sample Form. If I open that up, it opens up as a spreadsheet, and every time somebody fills it in, boom, 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 the data comes in. All right, and that's how it gets collected. Now, that's the mechanics, not necessarily the fun part. The fun part now is what I want to show you next, which is how to actually use forms in education and the fun things you can do with it. But I want you to at least understand the basic mechanics. Again, don't feel that you're going to leave an expert on that. There's a lot of questions I probably didn't cover as well as I could have, but that's the idea of how forms are created, how people fill them out, and how the data comes into a spreadsheet. So let's shift gears now, and let's talk about all the fun things you can do with Google Forms. Any questions before I switch that those gears? Yep. Yes. Can you prevent like a student going in twice? And doing it twice? Good question. Can you prevent somebody from going in twice? No, you cannot. But if you are saying that it's a student, then you should be able to turn on collect their username. At that point, once it's in the spreadsheet, you can have the spreadsheet filter to see if that's in there more than once, and you can kick out the extras. So you could do that. Good question, though. Oh, and I should say this. Um, every now and then, Google does a big update to stuff. If you've been following closely, Google Presentations was what got the latest big update. About a year ago, Google Presentations was, eh, OK. It was a decent slideshow maker. And then last fall, wow, they released a new version of Google Presentations. It's got all these animations now and transitions. Much, much better. According to the folks at Google Docs, Google Forms is the next thing to get the big update. So some of these things you might be asking, can it do this, can it do that? Maybe very soon. But at the moment, no. At the moment, no. Yes? Can you have a form only go live for a period of time? Good question. Can a form only be live for a period of time? Yes, but that is at your control. Okay. If I open up this form in spreadsheet mode and I go up to the form link in the top, you will see that there's an option that says accepting responses. Okay. If I uncheck it, it's not live. If I check it, it's live. Okay, awesome. You can't automate it. You can't say, okay. at 5 o'clock, turn off. You have to click it right now. Right. Yeah, okay. yeah. Any more mechanics questions? Things about the gears of how it works? Yeah. Going back to, to the edit form. Yes. If you put something as a text box. Yes. Good question. I am not aware of any limit to the text box. It's just hard to see. The text box can receive as much data as the paragraph text box. It's just hard for the user to see while they're typing it in. So it's more a matter of convenience, not that it, not that it limits you. OK? Good question. Always comes up. You, there's no option for pictures in Google Forms yet. That's one they keep saying as part of this update. We keep hoping, fingers crossed, that when the next version comes out, they'll include that. No, no, you can't put pictures in. Now, how do you get around that? What I see people do is, you know, if they're giving like a quiz in class or something, you know, they could have the form just be an ABCD kind of form and have the pictures as part of like a slideshow or something. Okay, here's question two. And they see the slide and then they answer it. So you'd have to supplement it. I really hope they add that in. I really hope so. All right, well, let's look at some fun ideas for how to use Google Forms. And I'm just going to blast through these, but we can pause on any of them to get in more depth if you want. The first few are more administrative, and then they get more educational as we go. So first of all, surveys. Anything you need to ask. We collect our parents' email addresses through a Google form. We did our BYOD surveys that way. Uh, I want a professional development 
ideas of what people want to learn about. In each of these cases, basically, it's just a form. Like, here's our BYOD survey for our kids. Tell us what grade you're in. Do you own a laptop? Would you bring it in? Do you own a tablet? Would you bring it in? Et cetera, et cetera. What do you see as the positives? What do you see as the possible negatives of BYOD? We sent this form out about a year or so ago before we launched BYOD to collect information from our students. It really helped us then to go, oh, wow, this many kids own laptops. This many have smartphones. These would be willing to bring them in. These would not. These are their concerns. These are what they're excited about. It was very helpful to help us shape our BYOD program. So we use Google Forms all the time for surveys. Okay? What's next? Routine forms, things that just got to get filled out. Um, for example, staff change. I mentioned that one before. Anytime we get a new staff member or somebody leaves or they get married or whatever, we need to know that. So here's one of those branching forms where based upon what you choose, it shoots you out to a different part. So I'll, the form says, tell me what kind of a change this is. Oh, it's a new staff member. No, it's somebody who's leaving. No, it's somebody who's changing their name. Well, if I say it's a change in demographics, like a new name, and I hit continue, I get a certain set of questions. Well, what's their new name? What's their new this? But if I said, no, it's a new staff member, I get a whole different set of questions. What building are they in? This, that, whatever. And so the form can branch off and it brings all that information back to us so we know what we need to do for this new staff member or whatever the change is. We use it for all kinds of stuff. Uh, our uh, English department has to get approval for books to be added to the suggested reading list. So we have a form they fill out, it submits that in, and then the committee can look at the results and decide if they want to add that book in. Um, any nomination forms for awards, we use forms to collect that. So routine forms, Google Forms is great. Can you um, yes. If you keep track of the link, the question is, can they use the old form and just make changes? Remember, if you check that box that says user may edit the form, as long as that link is preserved, as long as somebody holds on to that link it generates, then yes. So that's your challenge, is finding a way to harvest those links. And if you can, then it works. So yeah, yeah, there, there, there are options. There are ways that you can get around that. And we're actually playing with that uh, for next year. We're trying to do that with some of our forms. So we're working on it. Um, uh, for kindergarten registration, two years ago, we switched it from paper registration to having the option of filling it out online. And so this is nothing more than a digital version of the old paper registration. It's still the same amount of information. They're still filling out all that stuff, but it's coming in electronically, so it's a lot easier for our secretaries to copy and paste it or do whatever they need to to get it into the student information system. And again, helps you avoid misspellings and things like that. Good question. What percentage did do it digitally? I do not know. I can't give you a number. All I can tell you is that it was very high. They were very pleased. They were actually very impressed by how many did it that way. Now, having said that, we had a change in administration. And so this year, we had a different principal at our kindergarten center. And for various reasons, just felt that wasn't the way they wanted to go. So they went back to paper this year. But we still did something cool with, with Google Forms we'd never done before. Here's what they said. They go, Eric, we want to know anytime somebody takes one of the packets. Now, again, I'm saying paper. It was a PDF, so they would have to print it out. So it was, it was, it was digital in the sense that it was a PDF, but it was still paper in the sense that they'd print it out at home and fill it in and whatever. They said, is there any way we can track who's picking this up off the website? I go, well, I don't think so. And they went, oh, how about this? And so here's what we did this year. When a parent went to our website and said they wanted the registration forms, they got this form that said, what's your name, what's your home address, what's your phone number, and that they had to go in, they had to actually fill in like their name and then their home address and their phone number. I'll just fill in test here. What building they're going to attend, their email address. After they filled in their information and hit submit, on the confirmation screen, we put the link to the PDF packet. So when it said, thanks for submitting this, 
Now, here's the link to the PDF packet. We've had hundreds of people download that PDF packet, and we've collected all of their phone numbers and home addresses, and now they can follow up with them. This worked really well. So that, that was a neat way of using it. And so that one I'm calling access control. So you can use forms for access control. What else can we use them for? Resource scheduling. Um, our, for our labs, you want to sign up for a lab, you fill out a form, it collects what period you want, what day you want, what grade level, what subject area. That's great for the teachers to fill out, but then it's great for us too because then we can do data analysis on that to see which grade levels are using the labs the most, which subject areas are using it the most, because we can take those responses and put them into graphs and see that really quick and easy, which is nice. What's next? Student feedback. Here's one that we just started doing this year. At our middle school, they're doing a BYOD pilot. The high school is already BYOD. The middle school is now just becoming BYOD. And the kids have um, some iPads. They've got some smartphones. They've got different devices like that. And the teacher said, we want a way for the kids to be able to provide some feedback in class, to give some you know, questions, comments. And so what they did was the teachers made a form that has one question. <laughs> just what is your question? That's all it is. You know, type in whatever your question is. And then they made a QR code that points to that. Then they printed those out, laminated them, gave each kid one of them. Anytime during class that child can grab their cell phone or their iPad or whatever and they just use their barcode scanner, scan that in, takes them right to the form, type in their question, their comment, and it allows them to give feedback. Now some kids would never do that because they're fine just to do this. Not every kid is fine to do this. Not every kid wants to speak out in class. So those kids, they use the QR code, scan it in, type in their question, comment, goes right into that form. The teacher has it. And at the end of class, the teacher will say, OK, let's see what questions came in. And we'll address those sort of things. So it's a good way for student feedback. How about brainstorming? You guys were asked to fill out this form. Should look familiar. In one word, describe your school year so far. Well, what happened when you filled that out? Well, when you guys filled that out, it went into this spreadsheet. Now, these are back from earlier, so let's scroll down to yours. Whoops, go ahead and load that. Scroll down here. Scroll, scroll, scroll. All right, so you guys, I'm still in February here. Here we go, here's today, almost. Yeah, we go, here's today. So, you guys filled in all of this information today about how your year has been. I could ask, like I said, all kinds of questions of the kids. Uh, describe, you know, with an adjective, describe the hero from the chapter we read last night. Or use a word to describe the video we watched when we did the flipping the classroom last night and you watched the video that explained what we're gonna be doing today. You know, use a word to describe that or whatever. I can collect that information. Then what do you do with it once you collect it? Well, basically, you can throw that into like Wordle or Tagzito or something like that. I could come in here. I could click, copy, all of those. I could throw them into like a text editor if I just need to grab them there real quick. Okay, so let me grab all of these great words you guys gave me. So we'll copy all of those. And then all I have to do with all those wonderful words you gave me would be to head over to a site like Wordle paste those in, and hit go, let that run, and it will make a word cloud where the words that were said most often are bigger, the words that were said less, least off, less often will be smaller, and there it is. And then I can randomize it if I want it to look different. And you can get a real quick feedback from the kids brainstorming on the topic you're discussing. So a form is a great way to collect that. Now, I cheated a little bit, and I actually embedded it right here on this page. So um, I just stuck a little word cloud gadget from Google Sites right in there so it showed up. All right, what's next besides brainstorming? Data collection. I asked you guys how old you were and how many kids you had. Okay. You can do all kinds of data collection with kids. A good example would be like, I used to, teach, used to teach math. One thing I would do is I tried to teach them what pi was. And the important thing to realize is that it doesn't matter how big a circle is, the ratio of the circumference to the diameter is always the same. It's always pi. 
Well, I'd bring in a bunch of circular objects, you know, a can, a lid, a frisbee, a this and that. Give every kid their own circular object, hopefully different sizes. Give every kid a tape measure and say, I want you to measure the distance around and across. Well, I used to have to do this on my paper, <laughs> pretty much, because that was 20 years ago. But now you can give them a form and say, go to the form, type in what you found out to be the distance around your circle and the distance across. Now, they'll be off of them, but that's okay. Once that gets collected in there, what do you do? You go ahead and throw another column in that says divide this by that, boom. And then at the bottom of that column, tell it to average all of those. You would be amazed at how close it comes to 3.14159, blah, blah, blah. It's amazing. It's a great way to show them pi and to discover it. Well, for you guys, I asked you your age and how many kids you had. And so it goes ahead and it graphs that out. I could reload it, probably refresh it. But, and this is showing basically age and number of kids. So you can collect data very, very easily and then do whatever you want with it. And then what about quizzes? I asked you guys to take a quiz. And I asked like a math question and a science question and a social studies question and whatever. Well, what happened was all of that came into this spreadsheet here. There we go. So here's the spreadsheet. I need to clean out the people who filled this out the other day because they probably won't be excited if I, if I bug them. So let me delete those rows out. Okay, so this is just from today. So here's you guys. You filled out. We've got, wow, 66. Very good. Nice job. So this is the results that came from you guys. The first row is me, though. I filled that one out, okay? So if you want to do a quiz that you want it to be self-grading, you create the quiz in Google Forms, and then you take it once. You do need your data in there or else... You can't really tell what's right or wrong. So that's me filling it out. Now you may wonder, why does the one for the president have this percent or in there? That's my way of telling the flu guru script that there's multiple correct answers. It says Harrison or Grant or Hayes or Garfield. Okay, I'm giving it the different options, but you use percent or so it knows it's not the word or. It means, you know, the operation or. So I put in the correct answers once. You guys took the quiz. So what do you do? How do you grade something with Google Forms? Well, what you do, guys, is you use a script called Flubaru, and the way it works is you would go up to your insert menu, and you would say, I want to insert a script. Now, I've already done it, so I won't insert it again, but I'll show you how it works. You go insert script, and then in the script gallery, you'll find all these awesome things people have made. One of them is something called Flubaru. If I go to the featured scripts, It'll come up pretty quick. There it is, Flubaru. But if you can't find it, you can search F-L-U-B-A-R-R-A-R-O-O, -R -R Flubaru. And basically, all you do is click Install. And it installs that script into that spreadsheet, just that spreadsheet. You have to do it for each quiz. It's just for that spreadsheet. Once Flubaru is installed, here's how it works. You get a little menu option called Flubaru at the top. It's not there if you don't have it installed. If you look at the top and it doesn't say Flubaru, you don't have Flubaru installed, okay? Once it's there, you click it, and in the drop-down menu, you get an option to grade the assignments. Now, mine says regrade assignments because I did this before, so now I'm regrading it because I've used the same one a bunch. But I go in and I click regrade assignments, and it's going to say, are you sure you want to do this because it's going to wipe out my old grades? And I go, yes, I do want to do this. And basically, Flubru asks me a few questions. It says, how much are the questions worth? So for each question, I can make it one point, two points, whatever. And if it's not worth points, I could say that your name and your email identifies the student. So that one doesn't get a point value. Or I could say skip grading if I didn't want something to be graded at all. I'm going to leave them all worth one point. I'll hit continue. And now Flubru will say, tell me which row has the right answers. So, because I already filled it out and mine is on row two, I need to tell it that row two has the key once it is ready for that. Do, 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 do. Come on, Flubru. You can do it. Everybody's watching, Flubru. Thank you. Okay, here we go. Uh, so I say that row two from Sunday, February 12th has the right answers. I hit continue. And and away it goes. Flubaroo is now comparing your responses to my row two responses and seeing if you got it right or not. It's now creating a new spreadsheet at the bottom. Here's the submissions. It's making a new tab called grades. And in that spreadsheet, it's going to have how well you did. It's going to fill all that in. 
I'll be able to see how well each of you did, and I'll be able to see how each question did, so I can see if some questions got missed more than others. Grading is complete. And so here's all of your grades, you know, 100%, 60%, 40%, 20%. And then, at the bottom, is how well people did on each question. 30% got the question about science, the percentage of air. Ohio president, 76%, on and on and on. Anything below 70% gets highlighted orange, so I know a lot of people missed it. Well, now, that's good for me, but not for you. I know how you did, but you don't know how you did. So what do you do? You click Flubaroo, and you go to Email Grades. And now I can tell it to send out an email to each one of you with your scores and the answer key. You don't see anybody else's, just yours. And now it's emailing you out and giving you, this is what the quiz was, these were the questions, this was your answer, this was what was right, this is your score. And that's great because what we're looking at here, oh, somebody put in a bad email address. All right, well, okay. Um, gotta make sure they put in good email addresses. What's great about this, guys, is this is wonderful for formative assessment. I might not use this for an end of chapter test or something if I can't easily control and watch the kids that they're doing it right. But for a quick formative assessment, it's a wonderful way to give you an idea, are the kids getting it? Are they understanding it? It's wonderful for the kids so they know, am I getting it? Am I understanding it? It's that formative assessment that helps you adjust your instruction along the way. And that sort of feedback can be wonderful. So, with all of that said, any questions on forms? I know we went flying through that. Yes, question over here. Um, if I, I teach for physical math, and if I was to do like an essay quiz, am I able to teach the essay quiz and fractions Good question. Is there any special formatting like for fractions or exponents? No, there's not. So you'll have to explain to the kids this slash or the caret is for exponents, you're going to have to give them a little bit better understanding of that. No, there is not special formatting in the questions. Good question, though. Way back there, yes. Sorry, go Rainbow Dash. Uh, um, no, basically, good question. There is no way to stop somebody from taking the form more than once. Maybe that's something that will get added in the new updates that are coming, but no. It's, when it's open, it's open until you close it. Well, guys, I know everyone's excited about the giveaway, so you're going to head over there. I'll hang out here while I pack up to answer any questions. But you guys have a fantastic day. Thanks for taking the time and spending it with me.